oh, this will actually be my first Riders Network event, just to be in a physical space with, with other riders. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be really great, I think. Um, a, a long time ago, as far back as I can remember, I guess would, would be the answer, although that feels a bit, a bit myth-making to say. Um, I, I just know I, I grew up in a family of, of oral storytellers. Um, I kind of learned or was absorbing from an early age that the capacity to tell stories and the responsibility of sort of maintaining and passing down our family stories was important for us. You know, um, I come from a pretty working class background, so we didn't necessarily have a lot of money or sort of valuable possessions, but, but we had that. And, and I just sort of intuited early on, it was important. And then as I got older, I, I was genuinely interested, you know, in, in all these stories I'd heard and, finding out who exactly were these people and what were these kind of memories and events and places that my mother and her mother and her sisters kept returning to in stories. So um, part of it was, was that. And then also uh, my mom was a big reader of whatever trashy romance novel she could pick up at the checkout line in the grocery store. Uh, so uh, maybe not what I would choose to read now, but I always saw her with a book in her hand growing up. And, and my dad worked in the coal mines and he came home every morning with a the day's local newspaper and, and read it every day. And um, so those were just early examples that now looking back, I can see how influential they were on me and in, in wanting to tell stories and kind of valuing the written word in that way. And, and it, again, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't being instructed by them, but, but I was just sort of intuiting by, by example, um, that value and importance. Because I got to college and I thought I wanted to be a doctor because I come from a place where I made good grades in high school, you know, and then I got a scholarship and I went to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I'm, I'm from rural North Alabama originally. And uh, I, I was, I was the first in my family to, to, you know, get a four-year degree ultimately. And um, just, I didn't know what to do other than that I needed to go study something and come out with something useful, you know, have a job in, in kind of scare quotes and, and writing as much as I enjoyed it and as much as I enjoyed English classes didn't seem like I couldn't think of what a job would look like in, in writing and neither could no one I grew up around. And, but eventually I, I did have someone suggest, well, like, what about journalism? And it, you know, occurred to me, I guess at 19 years old that, oh yeah, somebody has to write those newspaper articles that my dad reads and that, that I've read, you know, and somebody has to cover these, you know, games that I watch on TV, these, these sporting events and um, surely they get a salary, you know, and, and that's a steady job. And so it was kind of like that <laughs> slow dawning uh, that occurred to me. So I studied journalism and, and I worked at a small town newspaper after graduation and, and I still do freelance journalism here and there because um, I guess it is my first sort of exposure to, you know, being a published writer and, and having uh, writing be a job instead of just kind of like a passion or an interest, you know, or, or a part of my identity. And, and I just, I burned out pretty quickly. Uh, and, and that's when I decided um, I was trying to write fiction, trying to write short stories in the evening when I'd come from work and I just couldn't manage it. And that's when I decided I'm going to quit and I'm going to go back and do one of these MFA programs that I'd heard so much about. It was the most important thing I ever did. I met my wife there in the program, and, and now we're, we're married and have a kid. Uh, I met mentors and, and friends that I still stay in touch with and, you know, still give me advice or listen to me complain or read my work, you know, or help me out. Um, and so that community that I built there at the University of Wyoming was just it's, it's impossible for me to say how important it was. And, and it was great for me because I was so burned out with journalism and I was ready for this break from kind of the real world to just go and uh, hunker down and read and write and be around people who wanted to read and write for a couple of years, very intensely that I took great advantage of it. And, and my thesis project was my, what became my debut novel Treeborn. And, and I got, you know, a couple of drafts of it done there and got some great feedback from, um, helpful feedback from from professors and, and friends and, and you know peers and, and the like. So um, it, it was just a step on that ladder to to where I am now. That without it, I, I don't think I would be sitting here talking to you at all. A friend of mine from from Wyoming from the program. We we have this joke about things being narrative research, and it's kind of just a way to let ourselves off the hook if we want to like 
watch a movie or like go fishing or whatever it might be <laughs> instead of sitting down to write. But I, but I, I don't think it is just a joke. And it's something I tell my students now that, yes, like you have to get out and away from the desk and out of the classroom or, or away from your job and live, you know, and experience things and observe, you know, the natural world or other people or, or places, you know, through travel, whatever it might be. And even if it's not, you know, things you were taking and directly putting onto the page that, that it will be in there and it will kind of subconsciously bubble up in, in some ways that will surprise you. But, but you got to be doing that narrative research to, to have it, you know, have the potential to, for it to happen, I think. Well, I've got a, a son who's about 15 months old right now. So a lot of my time not writing is hanging out with him, chasing him around. He's, he's real active, you know, gathering sticks, throwing things in water, uh, I don't know, reading books. He, he loves to read, which is probably not surprising considering who his parents are. Um, uh, so things like that, you know, and, and we love, we love to be outdoors. So we, we hike, you know, and it's winter time, so we're not in the water as much, but, uh, we're here in the mountains in, in Boone and there are wonderful rivers and, and lakes and things. So we love to swim and, and float and, and things like that paddle. Um, I'm a huge uh, sports fan, um, mostly college sports, although I do love NBA basketball. Um, so I watch a lot of sports when I can and, and find a lot of joy and fulfillment from the narratives that I see unfold in there. Um, I love to, to watch movies a lot, which I know is kind of getting that narrative research territory, but I, but I really do. I, I love to squeeze in a movie every chance I can and sort of learn from, from that uh, medium. Um, before the pandemic, we traveled a lot, which was wonderful and, and hoping to soon do more of that. I like to be outdoors. I like to be active. Um, and I like to, to talk, you know, so I like to get out and mingle and socialize and be on the phone too with people. You know, I've, I've lived all over the country at this point and so I have friends really spread out and I like to keep in touch with them and settle down for, for phone calls instead of just text or whatever when I can. So I spend a lot of time doing that too. Yeah. It's never been like, we, we never build the whole trip around one, but for sure, whenever my wife Irina and I travel, we start familiarizing ourselves with, with the literary history and, and kind of, present scene in these places that, that we go to and, and seek out some sort of pilgrimage or, or kind of activity or interaction. So uh, a couple of recent ones, we, the, the last international trip we took before um, the pandemic and, and before we had our kid, we went to Egypt for a few weeks. It was fantastic. It was really wonderful. Um, although we went in the summer and it was super, super hot, but uh, we, in going, we, we read a lot of the, uh, Egyptian uh, fiction by Egyptian authors in translation and uh, actually reached out to a couple of them who were living in Cairo in advance of our trip and said, Hey, we read your book. You know, we're writers too. We would love to meet for a meal or a, a, a tea or something like that and uh, talk, you know, and a couple of them said, yeah. So it's not necessarily a, a pilgrimage, but we got to, you know, meet other writers and on the other side of the planet and learn what it is like to be a writer there, which is obviously quite different than, than being a writer here. Um, so that was one thing. And then kind of maybe the most meaningful to me personally, which I wrote about a little bit in an essay um, a few years ago is we were in Mexico city and uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is one of my, my favorite fiction writers and nonfiction too, for that matter. Um, but a hundred years of solitude was really influential in me writing tree born. It was really kind of a touchstone. And um, we were in Mexico city and Marquez had already passed away, but I deduced from reading uh, news articles about his death in the morning and kind of celebration of, of his life, uh, the neighborhood he lived on, and then the actual street that he lived on where his, his widow still live, lived in the house. And we took a taxi out of this neighborhood and we walked around and we walked down the street and just sort of gazed at Marquez's house in Mexico City, which was on this beautiful kind of quiet street. And then it just so happened that uh, a bougainvillea vine was in bloom and some of the petals had fallen off like on the sidewalk. And so we gathered several petals and pressed those and brought them home. And then we like lacquered them and put them on paper and like in a frame. So it's kind of like one of my most prized possessions are these dried petals from this vine outside his house. Um, I don't know, I know some writers have like superstitions or kind of totems, I guess. And I certainly have 
I have a lot around and on my desk, but and that's not hanging down. It's hanging upstairs, but um, it, it's like a pilgrimage that was really meaningful and, and fun for me to, to get to do. Anytime you're traveling, it's like you'll, you'd be amazed at what you can, aside from just like the obvious, you know, graves or monuments or things like that to certain writers, it's just like, it's kind of amazing the places and the things you can find, or even from writers who, there are fiction writers where they really tap into autobiography, you know, to go to the places they wrote about or, or kind of lived, I think is, it's fascinating. I don't want to get real like woo-woo about it for me, but it's, it is, it's just, I find it extremely fascinating to kind of walk where they walked. I've been to the, in Asheville to the, to the Thomas Wolf house and um, walked around there a little bit. Um, uh, me and a buddy of mine, I, 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 and try, I wrote this essay that is just kind of lingering on my computer. We uh, did a hike here near Boone up Grandfather Mountain on this trail called the Profile Trail. And um, we, we were doing it kind of because I had read, um, it's the, the Balsam Groves something but it's this it's this like uh, novel from like the late 1800s early 1900s but that this local man wrote who's buried up kind of near beach mountain but anyway the, the novel is like about a, a walk uh, 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 that they take up grandfather mountain so we were kind of like recreating that in a way and, and talking about it and stuff so uh, it's not a very great novel but the history was kind of interesting um so those are a couple things and then uh, you know just getting to be here and know some North Carolina writers who are still living or, or recently passed away that um, have really been welcoming to me and um, become like friends and, 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 and acquaintances has just been, been great. You know, I didn't know what it was going to be like to move to the state when I came up almost four years ago for this job at Appalachian state. And um, I've just felt really welcome and I'm really in awe of the literary community here. Well, it's certainly one thing that keeps us here is that writing community. You know, it feels nice to live somewhere where it's valued, you know, from end to end, from, from mountains to the sea, kind of in the state. And I love how you can go in basically any city or medium sized town or even a lot of smaller towns in North Carolina. And there's a bookstore, you know, maybe it's used books, maybe it's new and used, but they're just kind of can't throw a rock without hitting an independent bookstore, which is fantastic when you're driving you know, across the state or, or somewhere and you can kind of just have a pit stop and browse books is, is a wonderful thing to have. It's not the case in every state, you know, especially in the South, I would say. Um, so I love that for sure. And uh, the state, I'm pretty in love and fascinated by it for, on like kind of a number of levels, you know, um, like from sort of a geographical and environmental level. I love the fact that we live here in the mountains and you can drive down and end up on the Outer Banks, which are a place that, that we go to every year. And I've written some journalism about and, and just find endlessly interesting, you know, its history and that changing landscape and how it feels sort of like the edge of the world to me to, to stand on the beach there. Um, so yeah, I just think it's a really special state in those respects. And, and the fact that I think the university system, you know, the UNC system certainly helps, you know, all the writing programs and wonderful English departments and the faculties that and visiting writers that those places bring in, but then the students that they, that they put out into the world too. Um, I think it just keeps that, I think it keeps it more alive and active than it being this thing where um, in some towns or states or places, maybe it feels like it's more of a tradition or a history, you know, it feels, it feels really alive. The literary uh, scene does here to me in the state. Yeah, and they, they probably do, but I, I really love this collection of, of short stories. It's, it's newer, um, called Sleepovers by Ashley Bryant Phillips, and she's from Woodland, North Carolina, which is out east, um, just a small town, a rural place, and Hub City Press out of Spartanburg, South Carolina, put this collection out, and um, it was just a fantastic publisher of, of uh, Southern literature, you know, and uh, Ashley's collection is just, it, it's wonderful. It's got such an aural quality to it, you know, like sound really matters, sentences really matter. Um, but the characters, and I hesitate to even call them characters because they just feel like people. They feel like people, you know, they feel flesh and bone and um, there's heart to them and, but, but not kind of uh, sentimentalizing in any way, you know, the rural experience. Um, there's, it's not like a, 
she's writing about class and, and, you know, folks in poverty at times, but it doesn't feel uh, like poverty porn or anything like that. You know, it's just like really considered and really thoughtful writing and they're, they're wonderful stories that um, I think, especially in this state, you know, for, for it to be a native daughter, every, every bookstore should carry that collection. I try to teach my students and, or, or tell my students, talk with them about what a small world the writing world really is. Like it may not seem like it when you're kind of emerging and a bit more on the outside, but the, the deeper you get into it, you know, if you go to grad school, if you start publishing, if you work in, you know, the editorial position, you realize it is pretty small, especially if you're thinking like literary writing, you know, which is, I guess, my, my world. Um, so I think, you know, if you, maybe you are somebody who didn't go to an MFA program, you know, or you didn't study writing in undergrad or you're new to the state, the fact that you could use it kind of as a community building tool. I mean, I, I've reached out, I still will, like I'll write fan emails to writers that I read something by theirs and I admire and I've become friends with some folks that way. And it's not like a sort of gross networking thing. It's, it's genuine. If I read, if I read something that moves me, I want to let that person know, because I know from, from my own experience, whenever someone has reached out to me about something of mine, they've read and said, Hey, this touched me in this way, or it sparked this, this in my mind. It's the most amazing experience in the world to ask me to do that. So I always make sure to do that. But anyway, so, so as a resource for that, you know, to say, um, to, for community building, you know, or to, to kind of familiarize themselves with the state if they're not from here or not from the South and moving in for, for whatever job. But, but what I was going to say, thinking kind of outside the, the writer bubble, is just how amazed I would have been as a kid coming up in Alabama if there was a similar resource in my home state. That I, to think of a young person in North Carolina, you know, to bring it back here, could go through this tool could use this resource to say like, Oh, there's a writer from my town that I had no idea about or from my County or my part of the state and kind of discover that and feel seen in some way, or, or feel like it's an achievable thing for them to be a writer. You know, it is, a, it is a job or it's a vocation that, that they could have. Um, I think would, it's, it's just an amazing kind of thing to think about a, a potential. You know.